his word tonight. And uh, we thank God for all of you who are signing on to our, our uh, Bible study broadcast. If you haven't already done so, uh, please take a moment and, um, and send the link to a friend. We want to get, in, uh, get ourselves acclimated and get ourselves used to the process, the whole process of evangelizing. And, and evangelizing means that we're sharing the gospel with someone. If we, if we were to uh, take a moment and say, hey, friend, hey, cousin, hey, sister, brother, hey, mom, hey, dad, hey, somebody, who all, somebody that we might know, associate, um, I'm actually about to uh, study the word with, with my pastor. And, and I want you to just uh, join in on us tonight so that we can discuss this tomorrow. How about that? Um, we'd be surprised of the different kinds of venues that we could actually uh, take to to share the gospel. And once you have a once you have an end, once you have a topic, once you have a, a point of discussion with someone, it then becomes the foundation for you being able to uh, witness to them, you being able to share uh, your testimony with them about how the Lord has changed your life. Um, so, so we're just saying all that just to say, let's be, let's do the work that's been assigned to our hands tonight, and uh, and maybe share it with somebody and just say, hey, listen, tune in with us um, for for the, for the next um, however long <laughs> it's going to be, and and then maybe uh, you know that will turn into some fruit, amen. So continue to pray about it. As, as usual, we thank um, anyone who's uh, joining the broadcast and you're visiting with us tonight. We thank you for being with us. Uh, we count it a privilege that you would just take time to study God's Word because God's Word is uh, is powerful. It's active, alive, and sharper than any two-edged sword, according to Hebrews 4 and 12. And we thank God for uh, a Word that can change us, can transform us, can heal us, can deliver us, can sharpen us, and can make us brand new. Um, so we, we thank God just for the opportunity to share His Word. I'm, I'm sitting down tonight. I just wanted to change a little bit of venue and uh, just change positions here a little bit and uh, try something different amen um, as we're as we're moving on we're, we're going to be trying some other different things I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunity where I can throw up the scriptures to you and be able to uh, talk from that standpoint as well amen so I'm getting myself um, in, in preparation for that as well all right so uh, so tonight uh, thank you for joining and uh, we're going to be studying from the book of uh, uh, first and second chronicles uh, and tonight we're going to be just covering the the last portion that we had of first and second chronicles that's going to um, that's that's really going to take us into our um, into our study of um, uh, getting us prepared to study uh, the prophets which is really going to be a, a productive and fruitful study a lot of people avoid the prophets um, and I know there's there are many books in between that we're going to just kind of summarize, but we're, we're going to make reference back to some of those books. But but a natural step from here, where we're going to be studying in uh, First and Second Chronicles, uh, naturally then will lead us to um, an in-depth study, a better in-depth study of the prophets. And I'm looking, and I'm excited about that. Um, so let's uh, let's get ourselves prepared, dive in. the The handout is the same as the one from last week. So if you, if you have the one from last week, then you're in good shape. If you don't have the one from last week, um, we're going to ask that you would um, uh, look on our website. Look on our, um, uh, on our website at www.haskellheightsfbc.com, and you can go to uh, all the way down to our handout button on our first page there. It's a splash page, and look under the Bible study handouts. It will be the last one. That's listed uh, for First and Second Chronicles, the introduction to the Chronicles, and um, you can print it from there or read it there, or you can use our church app, download our mobile app at Haskell Heights First Baptist Church, uh, and uh, it's entitled The Height. You can go down um, onto our Word and Worship button there and select Bible Study, and then the handout as well as uh, the the link for the broadcast would be on that button as well. Amen. And uh, if you have some friends that you want them to just be a part of our experience, it doesn't mean they need to join our church. Um, 
It just means that you want them to kind of be a part of your uh, your experience in the gospel ministry. Then they can download our app. It's not just for members. It's for anybody who will, will uh, download it and be a part of the Haskell family from a virtual standpoint. We, uh, we're delighted to have everyone to, to come in and just be a part of um, our, our, our ministry to uh, gospel ministry, amen, in this, um, in this dispensation. So thank God for that. Um, if uh, I want to uh, thank, uh, thank uh, you all for your prayers, consistent um, prayers um, for our members who have uh, suffered loss. Uh, my understanding also, our brother uh, Edward Murray on tonight, I just learned that he also lost his mother. So want to uh, want to ask that you would keep him and his family in your prayers. And uh, we just had the opportunity to celebrate the home going for um, for uh, Ms. Francis Nelson, which is the mother of Brother Isaiah Nelson. Amen. So we, we just thank you for for your for your love and your care over all the members as God has entrusted to us. All right. So without further um, announcement or anything, we're going to ask that you would uh, pull up Second Chronicles. Uh, well, well, no, I don't want you to go there yet because I got some things I wrote down that I'm going to kind of use by way of introduction. But we're going to um, end up in in Second Chronicles, um, and we're going to look at uh, chapter 20 um, tonight. We're going to look at chapter 20, and then we'll we'll conclude our study um, after that, after we, uh, with that sheet tonight. But um, let's pray, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to two scriptures. One is Romans 4.13, the other one is Galatians 3.14, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity just to study your word and um, just to be able to sit at your feet, Lord God, and to, and to learn from you. We thank you, Lord God, that um, we position ourselves, Lord God, we've consecrated this time just for the study of your word, Lord God, and we're asking that you would enlighten us, that you would illuminate your word, that you fill us with your spirit so that we might have discerning power to understand um, what your spirit is saying to us, Lord God, that we would get an individual um, edification, Lord God, and that we would get a corporate direction from, from your word, Lord God, that would strengthen us in this day. We need you. We need your influence. We need your direction. We need uh, just to know that you're by our side, God. And so we need your promise, Lord. What we're going to talk about tonight is your promise. And we thank you so much, Lord God, for, for making the promise that you did. You didn't have to do it. You didn't have to let that come out of your mouth. You know, there are certain things where, um, where people let things come out of their mouths and it damages people, Lord God, because of the derogatory nature of what comes out of their mouths. Lord God, but you let your precious word come out of your mouth and, and what comes um, forth out of your mouth won't return void. So we thank you tonight, Lord God, that you spoke some things that would bring us deliverance, bring us healing, bring us um, salvation, Lord God, incomplete. We thank you again, ask that you would cause us to be filled with your spirit and be attentive to your word and we bless you for it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want you to look at uh, first of all um, um, two two passages, and I want you to I want you to put those in that in that memory bank. Is that you know those are certain scriptures that you really should just kind of have at your disposal. Kind of um, remember them. Look look forward to um, uh, memorizing them. Do you know do some of the work that you um, do do a lot of the work that that we uh, that that we have purpose to do. Amen. In the gospel. Um, by, by knowing certain passages at your disposal, all right? And these are two that are very important for us right now. First, in Romans 4 and 13, I'm turning there in my Bible, um, and I'm going to read uh, 13 through 16. So let me, let me do that. It's gonna, we're, gonna, we're actually going to go 13 through 16 because uh, that really encompasses more of the story. The actual verse that I want is in 13. But it says this, uh, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Let me say that again. For the promise, this is the promise we're talking about, that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham, was, it wasn't made to Abraham, meaning that you're going to be the heir of the world, that promise, 
or to his seed, meaning that his this being his physical seed, right, through the law. And so what, what it's really saying there, it wasn't through the law that this promise was made. It wasn't because of something that was written. It wasn't because of something that was commanded or something that was mandated. But, but it was saying, look at this, says, but through the righteousness of faith. So the promise was made um, through faith. The promise was accessible only through faith. The promise wasn't accessible through the law. You get that? Um, look what it says going down to verse 16. For if those who are of the law are, are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. I like this one because it says, if, if those who are of the law, and this is Romans 14, is trying to, Paul is really trying to give some kind of context to help, um, to help believers to understand this dilemma between the law and and grace or the law and faith. He's really trying to help them to understand the, the essential difference or how the law was played, what, what was positioned in the Old Testament and how faith is positioned in the New Testament. So it says, for if those who are of the law, meaning those Old Testament saints who receive the law, are heirs, if they become heirs, then faith is made void. Then faith is nothing. It's not necessary because if we're getting things through the law, in the Old Testament, the law of the Old Testament, then then the faith doesn't really have a context. It really doesn't, it's not necessary. It's made void. And the promise is of a, no effect. I would ask you to underline that part there. The promise of made is made of no effect because it's really reinforcing what we said back in verse 13, that, that the promise is only accessible by faith, that the promise is not accessible by the law. And, and, you know, and so what we're talking about is this promise that was made to Abraham. Now look at verse, um, look at verse 15, because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression, right? It, unless there was a law said there was, you can't cross the line if the line hadn't been drawn, which was says, if there was no law, then there really is no transgression or no sin. Verse 16 then says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That, that's an important passage for every Christian to understand because it really ties you then you know, um, it ties you back to the Old Testament promises. It ties you back to everything that God promised uh, in that Old Testament context. There is a tie. There is there is a faith tie that you are made. You're not. You're not. You can't access this because you are of the tribe of Israel. You are accessible to the, the promises accessible to you through faith. And that is, make, which then makes you, according to verse 16, um, a child of Abraham. He's the father of us all, the father of faith. Those who are of the faith are, are children of Abraham and the promise of Abraham, promise to Abraham, then is accessible to them. Does that make some sense? I hope that, I hope that helps us. So I'm going to say this, that the promises of God are received by faith. There's no other way to receive the promises of God. They're accessible to us only by faith. They're not accessible by what you do. They're not accessible by how you obeyed the rules uh, that were set forth in the Old Testament. They're only accessible to you by faith. So whatever God has promised, you can have it, but only by faith. All right. So now I want you to turn with me, <coughs> excuse me, to Galatians 3.14. Galatians 3 and 14. All right. Um, and Galatians 3.14 reinforces that same thing again. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Look at this. Through faith. Let me give me some more. Get, um, promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. That, um, that the, even the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That, the, that he brings um, and he brings the fullness of Christ to us. But, but that is only accessible, again, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon, look at this, the Gentiles, might come upon the Gentiles 
um, in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Those two are very critical and important passages for you to understand because they really are communicating to you that the promises of God are received by faith. What is faith? It's trusting, believing, and relying upon. Trusting, believing, you could reverse those and say believe, trust, rely upon. But, but trusting, believing, relying upon what God said. And so when we, when we encounter his word, every time we have an opportunity to study the word of God, that when we receive, uh, when, when we get the word of God, what we're doing is we're reinforcing our faith. Amen. It says, um, it, it says in Romans, it's same, same book, but we're going to go into chapter 10, um, where it says that, um, that faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God, right? And so, so really then faith comes by the word of God. So when you are studying the word of God, you are reinforcing your faith and your faith then is the vehicle upon which the promises of God are received. Amen. Does that, does, does that kind of bring some clarity there? I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I'll kind of tell you why I'm, I'm doing this because it's important that we understand this context before we um, look down into our, into our passage. <clears throat> um, so, so look at this Romans 413 plus Romans 3, I mean, Galatians 3, 14. And notice it's 4 and 13 and 3 and 14. They're just kind of, uh, you know, for those, who, all of you who are a little mathematical, um, it's the, you know, um, instead of 3, 14, it's 4, 13, and then 3, 14, Romans and Galatians. Good way to under, uh, relate it. I like to look for, for patterns in Scripture that way. All right. But, but, but the promises are yours. That you can claim the promise. And I said this, if you can claim the position and if you can claim the portion, amen, you can claim the promise, but you got to claim the position, which means that you have to have it's the identity. You've got to be related to Abraham by faith. It's a position. You're, you're a child of God. You are the child of Abraham by faith. You're a child of God. That's a position. That's an identity. That's a, but you have to also claim the portion Amen. Jesus had a portion and because he had a portion, we have a portion. Amen. So so you can't just a lot of us like to, you know, one of the problems we have in the body of Christ today is that folks like to claim the promise. And so we're excited about the promise, but we don't necessarily we're confused about our position. Right. I tried to clear that up by giving you two scriptures that was really trying to tell you who you really are. That's your identity. That, um, that if you're connecting yourself to the law and attaching yourself to the law, then you're attaching yourself to something that will eventually be void. But, but you're the child of Abraham and recipients of the blessings of Abraham by faith. The promises of God are received by faith. Amen. All right. So, um, so, so having said all that, then look at what I said. Um, we talked about this on last week, that first and second Samuel and first and second Kings really um, covers, Chronicles covers the same historical period as uh, the information that we learn in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. In First and Second Samuel, we, we are introduced to this whole idea of a king. This whole idea, if, before that, we, we did not have the monarchy. We had judges. We had, we, we had patriarchs. We had different kinds of rulers that would rule over God's people. Um, we had we had the prophetic leaders who were like Moses and Joshua, who would bring them out of captivity and into the land of Canaan. And when they got into the land of Canaan, they were among the uh, they were among the the people of the land, and they wanted what the people had, and the people had a king. Amen. And so when we're talking about this, um, and I put this I put this word down here because I said I was going to be faithful to ask you to um, focus in as we're studying through the kings this idea of election, because as the king goes, so do the people go. So um, it's, it's, it's important, it's paramount that you would pray during this process, this election process, because a king actually uh, determines the fate of the nation. A king will actually, you know, determine the fate of the nation. So when you, when you understand that, when you, and and by implication, let me let me see if I can bring it home. Let me let's bring it to, into uh, today's 
uh, today's conversation. That, that the king then represents the one who has been given charge over the people. And if you were to make that the pastor, in, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that, that, the, um, that the souls of the people are charged to the responsibility of the pastor, which really gives, gives the pastor a very unique uh, responsibility um, of authority over, over the people because he's responsible for the development of their souls. And so when, when we look at this whole thing, if you, if you want to prosper, the natural place, God gave us a grace, the natural place to begin is to pray for the one who has charge over your lives, who has charge over your spiritual lives. Amen. If you're, if you're praying and undergirding, that's why God tells us to pray for those who have ruler, rulership over you, have authority over you, so that you may live your days in peace. I don't know if many of us got that. And, and, you know, and God knows, uh, you know, I don't necessarily want to have to revisit this so that God will say, hey, I'm going to give you a second chance, a second term <laughs> to see if you can obey my rule so that so that you can you can get grab the significance of which we still got a few days left. Get in line, come into come into obedience and understand what God's will, what his plan, what his purpose is is to, to cause us to, to recognize that if we will undergird the king, the king then will, 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 be, uh, will, will be directed by God so that it will impact the lives of the people in such a way that the people will prosper. Amen? Amen. So hopefully, hopefully that, that's, that's my election tid, tidbit. Um, and, and, and literally, um, I know we have, we, we literally have, um, everybody has a choice for who they want to elect. Don't put so much stock in, um, in your choice. Don't put so much, that's like David having put, put all the stock in, in, in his ability, in his physical ability to win wars when he was trying to dominate the, um, those who had possession of the land that God gave the Israelites. But David didn't trust in his own abilities. He trusted in the power of the Lord. And so he consulted God. He prayed to God. He prayed for God's servants. He did, he did some unusual stuff that Christians, quite frankly, ought to learn how to do and model from David so that we could, we could really come into a position of humility. If my people who are called by my name will look at this, humble themselves, come to a place of humility and pray. When you pray, you're humbling yourself. You're saying, God, I don't know what to do unless you give me directions. You're saying, God, you're more powerful than I am. You're acknowledging that, um, that, that, that God alone has what you need, the resource you need for you to prosper. And so that's the, that's the essence of your prayer life is to humble yourself, recognize that you don't have the tools, the skills, the wisdom, the resources, the anything, the wherewithal you need to prosper. And asking God then gives God the understanding that you recognize, you acknowledge who is in, who sits high. Amen. And so um, th that's what we want to talk about. Um, that first and second Chronicles really talks about the time from King David all the way to King Cyrus. And King Cyrus is the Persian king that at the end of the captivity of the Israelites, um, we talked about that in, in 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, that first Israel was, was uh, uh, taken captive by Assyria, and then um, Judah or Jerusalem was then destroyed and taken captive. We'll see that in the last passage tonight, was then taken captive by um, by Babylon. So when they were in captivity, it was King Cyrus who then released them out of captivity and directed them to go back to their homes and rebuild. That's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, which is coming up next. So he ordered them to go back home and he gave them the, he gave them the, uh, uh, the authority and he gave them the resource, go back home and rebuild your land. Amen. So the favor, he wasn't a Christian, but it was God's favor that was on him that caused him to tell God's people to go. We, we could preach on this. We can preach on this all night because there's some, you know, you work for some folks that are so far away from the Lord. But if God can put his hand on Cyrus and tell him, release my people and, and, and set them free to go back to build. 
it wasn't a Pharaoh situation because he actually favored Israel. Amen. And so, if you know, you might you might have someone who has authority over you, but you and in your obedience to God and in your prayer to the Lord, um, that if, if you would pray rightfully for the king, the king then would have favor on you, and and it's actually the favor of God. He won't even know why he's doing what he's doing. You know what I mean? Or she won't know why she's doing what she's doing. Whoever it is who's in position of authority. But they will then um, release you to God's favor. Amen? So that's, that's good stuff right there. But but First and Second Chronicles talks about a spiritual perspective on the historical uh, things that happen in the context of First Second Samuel and First Second Kings. I told you last week that the uh, when I gave you that that tile, if you look on your your handout, you'll see that um, you'll see. Can you give me the um, back side of that. Um, the the um, first and second first and second Samuel. Um, uh, I'm sorry, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings is related on your top sheet to the to parallel passages in first and second Chronicles in first and second chronicles so you could see what passages actually map into uh those those same passages where the same story is told but from a spiritual perspective okay so hopefully that that'll kind of get you enough information to understand if you started to read the book of first and second chronicles it's not just a oh man i read this already put it down um in first and second samuel Reread it because it's actually giving you a spiritual perspective on the historical information. All right. And so it's from it's written from that perspective. And it actually gives you um, what, what, what's been told about Chronicles is that it gives you a snapshot of Israel from its birth all the way up to King Cyrus. It really talks about the journey of Israel. So if you if there was one book that you wanted to get the composite story, it'd be first and second chronicles. All right. All right. So last week we talked about um, uh, first and second chronicles here. Um, second chronicles. We looked at this passage in, in second chronicles seven, which was very familiar, um, which where uh, God, God makes an appearance to, to Solomon and and he says um, he says to him, I've heard your prayers, and I've chosen the, uh, this place as my for myself as a house of sacrifice. He said, When I shut up heaven, I, I um this was Second Chronicles uh, seven twelve when, and thirteen now says, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. We talked about that that there are acts that are associated with the disobedience of the people that will naturally come forth from the disobedience of the people. He says, when you do this, he told you this is a grace. He, in verse 14, then he says, if when all that happens, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, right? Um, and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So God says, when you get yourself into trouble, how many folks can just admit tonight that, that yes, I have through my own rebellion, through my own stubbornness, through my own selfishness, through my own love affair with sin, through my own uh, just uh, just. I, I don't even want to use the next word I'm thinking, but you know, j just my own practice of 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 um, being against God, uh, just just because I didn't want to, you know what I mean? Some things that I believe, uh, but, you know, this love affair that we have with the flesh, this love affair that we are having with the world, and the things that we want, and and we we would tend to say, hey, listen. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, I, where we have made a conscious decision not to follow God. Um, there are, when we made those kind of decisions, those don't come without consequence. The consequence that God was saying, when I shut up the heaven and there's no rain. When I command the locusts to devour the land. When I send pestilence among the people. So, you know, and, and so we should, we should look at, Christians should look at coronavirus at, with a whole new perspective with a spiritual perspective and say, this isn't something that just kind of blew in, you know, from the sea, you know, by chance, we're supposed to look back at 
What is it that we're doing that might be perhaps offending our God? What is it that's causing us um, to not to abide in that position of blessing that God wants for us and has ordained for us to live in? What's standing between us and our relationship with God? He says, when I shut up to heaven, he says, look at this. He gave you a prescription. And if every church would be faithful, he said, if then when that happens, if my people, not, not if the folks in Washington or if the folks in Columbia or if the folks in um, Louisiana or if the folks in Detroit or if the folks in, you name it, Los Angeles. He didn't say it. He said, if my people. He said, you want to, and the last thing, heal their land. The whole land will be healed by my people. If my people who are called by my name, he says, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So, so we have command over this culture that God has put us, almost almost given us this kind of jurisdiction or authority. It's called dominion, amen? Uh, dominion authority, whereby we will impact the entire culture by our relationship with our Christ, with our God, right? He says, then I will, um, he said, then I will hear uh, from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. So the healing of the land is attached to the forgiveness of sin. Every one of us, please make it your priority. Um, let, let's not just let this be a good word. Let's let this be an active word, alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's let this word be um, for real in us. Every one of us ought to go to God and say, God, I am your child. I am the called. I am your, I, I, I'm part of your family. I'm the ones you're talking about, if my people. It wasn't just the Jews. I gave you all this explanation that Paul was up here trying to say that, no, that, that we, uh, we are connected to this promise by faith, right? We are still the children of Abraham. So if it was written to Abraham, there is a sense in which this belongs to us. Amen. By faith, this belongs to us. And we need to get on our faces and say, God, we want to turn from our wicked ways. God, we want to pray. We want to we want our land healed. Amen. That that Washington can't heal the land. Bringing somebody new in is not going to heal the land. It's just going to bring a different set of issues. Amen. We we have jurisdiction. OK. Chronicles is a powerful book because I want to I want to take you now to uh, Second Chronicles chapter uh, twenty um, verses one through twenty three. Um, Second Chronicles twenty one through twenty three and 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 those of you who've been with me in um, in ministry for a minute, you know this is probably one of my one of my favorite passages. The Lord just kind of ministers every now and again. Uh, for this and and it happens to be you know because of you being a musician because of you uh you know because of uh worship being a very powerful theme for me and 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 for the people of god uh but second chronicles 20 um was israel then was look at this was in trouble with um amon moab and mount seir um and so if you turn with me to second chronicles 20 second chronicles 20 um verses 1 through 23 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 through 23. Um, all right, and it says this. It says, it happened that uh, after that, after this, that the people of Moab, um, remember the people of Moab were the people on the other side of the Jericho just before, uh, on the other side of the Jordan, just before they went into Jericho. But the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. He was one of those. Uh, he was. He was one of those kings that was considered to be one of the only good kings, right? Talked about Jehosha, Jehoshaphat. Talked about uh, Hezekiah and Josiah were the definitive good kings, and Jehoshaphat had had some had some goodness. He had some. He was in between. He had some good traits, but he was he was uh, ordinarily considered to be one of the better kings, and they would only exist in Judah, if you remember from a couple Bible studies ago. But it says they came to battle against Jehoshaphat, which means the people of God, because he's the king over them. 
Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in um, Hazazan, Tamar, which is in En Gedi. And these are places, so don't let that, um, don't, don't let that mess you up. Um, verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So this is why we're, why we're saying um, Jehoshaphat was one of those kings that, that kind of, he knew the Lord. He knew that, listen, they're coming to battle against us, and, and you ought to come to a place where when things come against you, stop then and, and seek the Lord. You know what I mean? Don't try to fix it first. Don't go to complaint. Don't get crazy with fear. Don't get any of those natural responses that we would normally have when something comes upon us. First thing, first thing is, look, he, he feared um, and set himself to seek the Lord. You see that? And, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Look at that. He, not only that, he was like, all of us need to come down and seek the Lord. These people are coming against us. So verse four, so Judah gathered together to ask help. Um, from the Lord and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So they were in unison. They were unified together. They were seeking God. And the church has got to come to a place where we learn to seek God. Amen. I believe that that's one of the places, you know, we, we just can't, it's not the job of the pastor or of the deep praying deacons or of the prayer warriors or intercessors. It's for the entire community. Anybody who has a relationship with God ought to learn to seek him. Amen. And we got to learn how to seek him for uh, one of the things we got to do going back is pray about everything. I ask all my leaders, when we go back, I want you to call leadership meetings for nothing but prayer. Nothing but, don't discuss business, don't worry about, you know, prayer is the essential to evangelism. Prayer is the essential for God to lead you out of battle. Prayer is the essential for overcoming and being victorious in everything that God has positioned your hands for. So, so we, we see a good model in a good king. That's what should happen. That's what should happen in the United States. When we get to these places of crisis, we should have had a leader who would say, first thing we're going to do is proclaim a fast in this nation. First thing we're going to do is we're going to call, we're going to call all the people of God to prayer because the people of God actually will initiate the change. The, the, this, this Corona will lift when we get in position. Hallelujah. Verse 5, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven and uh, do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hands is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? It's good when you just build God up. God, you're more powerful. You're, God, you're, you're worthy. You're, you know what I mean? This is almost a praise party they started. He said, God, listen, let me just call to remembrance. And God was saying, you don't need to build me up. I know exactly who I am. But it's important that you know who I am. I am the one, look at this, the God of your fathers, you, who sits in heaven, who rules over all the kingdoms and the nations, who who has power and might and that no one is able to withstand me. I know who I am. I want you to know who I am. That builds your faith. That makes you trust him. That makes you believe him. That makes you rely upon what he said. And so then, then when you can do this by faith, the promises of God now are received by that faith. And so that's why your prayers ought to start off with, God, you are great. You are magnificent. You're the God who brought me out the last time. You're the God who saved me in that predicament. God, I remembered when you stepped in in the nick of time. God, I know I heard what you it did for my grandparents. I heard how you brought us out. All those kinds of things is really where Jehoshaphat really kind of st st um, started there. And and look at look all the way down um, verse seven. Are you not God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary in it. For your name saying, if you don't know the history of God, if you don't know how God has moved, if you haven't listened to the stories, if you haven't studied the way God has done stuff, you won't know what to attribute to God. It means that when you know these things about God, then you can call to relationship the fact that you know these things about him. Amen. 
And that's what he was doing here. If disaster comes up on us, verse 9, sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, we will, um, we will stand before this temple and in your presence for um, your name is in this temple. Remember the prayer back in 2 Chronicles 7 that Solomon prayed? Look, look at this. He says, and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. Verse 10, and now there, now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned them, turned from, from them and did not destroy them. Here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession. Look at this. Coming to now, that those were the ones, if you remember in the story, that those were the ones that said, hey, let's, let's covenant with you. Don't touch us. When God told them, no, get rid of everybody, is that don't touch us. We're on your side. But now, later on down the line, when you didn't listen, those are the ones who came to be a, a, a thorn in your side. Amen. And verse 12, oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Underline it, circle it, do something. God, we don't know what to do, and God, we don't have enough power. Will you find yourself in that situation financially? If you find yourself in that situation according to a health condition, if you find yourself in that situation according to a circumstance in your life, in your family, on your job, whatever it is, you acknowledge, God, I don't have power, and I don't have the person that's coming against me is greater in power, but my eyes are on you. That's David kind of um, faith. That's that. I know it's a bear. He's bigger than me. I see Goliath. He's bigger than me, but, but, but my eyes are on you and you're bigger than him. Right. So, so look at this. It says now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children stood before the Lord. Verse 14, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, um, um, ben I'm sorry, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Le a Levite of the sons of Aphath. They're just giving the, the lineage of these people so you know who they are. In the midst of the assembly, the spirit of the Lord, that means the Holy Spirit came down. The prayer, they were praying and the spirit came down to intercede. The Holy Ghost came down in verse 14 to intercede and said, listen, all of you Judah and your inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle, and guess what? I want to tell somebody right now, what you're going through, the battle's not yours. God, what, what would God look like to put the battle in, in you put the battle in your hands and you don't have the resources? The first place you ought to recognize is that, you know what, God, this is too big for me. The battle's not yours, it's, but it's God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Z's, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. You will not stop cussing, stop fussing, stop complaining, stop drawing your guns, stop trying to plot and configure yourself. He said, you will not need to fight in this battle. Look what it says, position yourselves. Look at this. The promise happens because of your position. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not, be, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Would you say this? The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. Amen. And, and you need to tell yourself that in your circumstance. The Lord is with me. When you're going for that loan that you don't think you're going to get because your credit's not is not worthy right now. The Lord is with me. Hallelujah. When God sends you. Hallelujah. Verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. He's still in a humble position. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They got down on their faces and they began to worship the Lord. I, but I hope that when we get back to the building, that folks will stop their pretty, that stop all that pretty and get down and bow your face to the Lord. 
Amen. If you don't want to get on the floor, then get low. Hallelujah. But but bow your face to the Lord. Get in worship position. Then the Levites of the children of the Koh um, Kohathites and the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Look at verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he preached to the people, gave them directions and said, do this. He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Look at this. Circle this. Verse 22. When they now when they began to sing and praise. You'll not need to fight in this battle. Mm. You need to learn how to put a praise song on. Mm. You need a praise song in your office, maybe. When, when folks are getting on your nerves and you, you see the enemy is coming against you, right? Coming in at you. And, and guess what? You need to put a praise in, on your lips. That's the acknowledgement that you recognize, I don't have to fight in this battle. Right? Wow. He said this. He said, um, and, and look what it says. The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon. Why is that? Because in verse 14, the Lord sent the spirit down upon Jehaziel. The Lord sent the spirit, just like the spirit was hovering over the face of the deep in, in, in Genesis 1. He came down and intervened in this, in this situation. You need the spirit to intervene in your circumstance. Second Chronicles teaches us something very powerful here, that guess what? Stop trying to intercede on your own behalf. Let the spirit intercede for you. You get yourself in position for praise. The promise is when you're in position. Hallelujah. Look at this, verse 22, uh, verse 23. For the people of Ammon, Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. You know what? Stop trying to fight your enemies. Let your enemies go to battle against each other. Let the Lord orchestrate it so that they'll destroy each other and you don't have to have blood on your hands. Just a praise on your lips. Last, last thing I'm going to say, and then we're going to, and we're going to um, cut loose for tonight. Um, Second Chronicles, go all the way to verse uh, chapter 36, verse uh, chapter 36, and it's just a few verses from there. Um, want to just make sure that you understand this as we leave this book. Second uh, Chronicles 36, starting at verse 17, says, "So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them." That this, that, that's here. Um, King David, somewhere down in here, about here, they were now, Babylon was, was brought, and they were there for 70 years. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't, you know, sometimes we're saying, is this corona over yet? I don't know when the corona is going to be over. I don't know. Stop worrying about when it's going to be over and get in position. Do what we're supposed to do. Let's stop counting the days, the number, the years, the when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen and when that's going to happen. Let's just get in position and be the church. Look at that. He says, so the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women and old and the infirm. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to Babylon all the articles, large and small, used in the temple of God and the treasures from both the Lord's temple and from the palace of the king um, and his officials. Then his army burned the temple of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces and completely destroyed everything of value. They, the few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon. And when they became servants to the king and the sons of the kingdom of Persia came to power. This is when Persia is coming in. Um, look at this here. That the few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon and they became the servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. Cyrus was the king of Persia. And, and when Cyrus came to power, God put a spirit on Cyrus that said, send the people back home, rebuild their land, make them, help them rebuild, help them restore, help them revive, help them revitalize. He put a spirit on Cyrus. He made the king um, help the people come back 
to to the place. I, I said this here that this was Cyrus was the was the king, and you can read this in your history book now because now this is the place where the Bible starts to meet history, where the the stuff that we read in the classroom that King Cyrus was historically known for favoring God's people, but it was a demonstration of God's faithfulness. He says, "My promise will never fail." That God says it wasn't all over, but I want to tell, I read that last passage in your hearing before we pray to close out tonight, because I wanted you to understand this. A lot of us are saying, Pastor, when are we going back to church? Pastor, when are we? And, and yes, at this point, we are, we're talking about, um, with, you know, we're, we're going to contact you and we're talking about going back into the sanctuary um, uh, on, on the fourth Sunday, amen? Orderly, according to instruction, for Sunday in this month, amen. We're doing a, a leadership walkthrough on this kind of this Sunday, and then we're going to do another walkthrough on Saturday before next Sunday. But we will be you'll be getting a call, you'll be getting contacted and information for those of you who feel it's time, amen. Um, for those of you who are saying, No, I don't. Um, we are going to continue to have our uh, electronic and virtual services. You'll be able to see like you've been able to see since March. Um, and, and we're going to upgrade and embellish that because we don't want anyone left out. Amen. But, but I want somebody to understand that if God would allow the Babylonians to come in and destroy his temple, the place that was built for his name, that he gave to Solomon, God is not putting stock in your pretty church house. He wants the people of God to be the people of God. It's not about the building. It's about the God we serve. And it's about the, it's about the calling that we, that we have on our lives to be the kingdom builders of the almighty God. Amen. And, and we don't want to learn a hard lesson that God would let it be burned down, let it be destroyed, and we be taken captive before we can learn the lesson. Because because guess what? God, that won't be the end. God will eventually allow us to come back because he's faithful. But how many folks really want to go through all that just to learn the lesson? If I, I'm going to learn my lesson from the pestilence that we're in the midst of right now so that I can hear from my God and recognize some people need to make a 180. Some folks need to make a turn. Some folks need to say, you know what? I haven't been, I've been acting like a phony. I've been acting like a hypocrite. I've been acting, I've been, you know, I've been blaming everything but myself. And you need to get yourself in line. I'm getting myself in line. You get yourself in line and say, guess what? We need to be the people of God who are called to do his will. We need to do things the way God has prescribed for us to do them so that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, will you humble yourself? Will you come into line with what God says? Can, can it not be about you for change and let it be all about God? Amen. And, and pray. Will you pray? Will you commit yourself to pray? Call that prayer line. The prayer line, the information on the prayer line is on the website. Just dial up the website and the information's up there so that you can learn how to connect with us on that prayer line. It's on the church app. If you got the mobile app, go there, dial in on the prayer line, help us to, uh, let's exalt God, let's pray to him. We've got everybody in the church praying, old folks, young folks, women, men, officers, everybody's praying because everybody has power. Mm. Glory. We're coming together in a Second Chronicles 7, 14 way so that we can, so we can obey God, so that, so that his faithfulness can be revealed in us and we can impact this world the way we were supposed to. Come on, let's pray. Father, we bless you and we, we love you. We honor you. God, thank you for what you wrote in your word. Thank you for the warnings. Lord God, thank you for the example. Lord God, in the people that pre-existed us, thank you for helping us to know how you react to the extremes of idolatry. Thank you for helping us to know, God, that you will, will not let your promise fail no matter what. Lord God, thank you for teaching us the ways of faith. Thank you, Lord God, that you said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so that when we're in the word of God, that while we're studying the word, our faith is being strengthened and the promises of God are being received by faith. So God, thank you just for the time that we separate to do this. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the provisions. Thank you for grace, God. 
Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Lord God, I, I speak right now over your people, your peace, your power, your protection, your provision, your productivity, your purpose, and your prosperity. Lord God, to manifest in their lives, Lord God, in every aspect of their lives, in their, in their work life, in their family life, in their personal lives, Lord God, in everything that you have called to their hands. And at the hands of the people, hallelujah, whatever they set their hands to will prosper. And every place that their feet shall touch, Lord God, will be claimed territory for your cause. Help us to become kingdom builders. After your, uh, after your will. God, we ask that you would forgive us our sins and help us to turn from our wicked ways and, and, and come back to you. And we love you for the opportunity just to do that because it said in your word, Lord God, that if we, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord God. If we just call out your name, Lord. If we just if we just position ourselves, Lord God, back in your favor. We thank you for it. We love you. And we bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, thank you again for just uh, taking time to study the word of God with us. We'll see you next time.